So yes, as um, I was introduced, I'm a software developer at the Bennett Institute, which I will shorten just Bennett if I'm referring to it in the future, just to keep things super quick and moving. I'm, I've done a lot of work on documentation for the Open Safer platform, but it's definitely, as we'll see, a team effort. Um, so it's not just my work, there are other people involved as well. So what I'm going to cover in this talk is initially just explain Open Safer very quickly, because I think most people probably have heard about Open Safer from one of you other talks or just from other information they already know about. I'm then going to talk about how we're building the documentation with Python-based tooling. And then finally, I'll move on to a, a, a little bit of just a wrap up and talk about documentation as code, what that means, and how what we do at OpenSafely kind of fits in a bit with that, and the approaches you might take away to think about doing your own documentation. So OpenSafely, really quickly, it's a trusted research environment. We already heard about it, I think, mentioned in the keynote this morning. A trusted research environment for working with electronic health record data, so a way of for researchers to query uh, GP data and make use of that information while still respecting patient confidentiality and privacy. And it's been interesting on two different kind of axes. One of them is that it was developed in response to the COVID pandemic. So a lot of the research has been done. You can see some on this slide here. There's, there's lots and lots of papers that have been published relates to COVID and COVID's effects on different patient groups and NHS services and, and, and much more. The other aspect which is quite interesting is as this model for working with sensitive data in a way which respects pr privacy and enables researchers to work with that data without them having to download all the data onto their laptops. So even the name Open Safely, the two parts of the name, the Safely part res refers to that aspect. So researchers are not just downloading all the data onto their laptops, they are writing their study code on their own machine or wherever they want to work. It could be a cloud instance, it could be on their own laptop. And then they take their study code and then they send that study code to where the data is held so they don't get access to the underlying data. And after the outputs are approved, they then get those outputs and are able to actually publish them in scientific papers or other work reports that they're working on. The open part is referring to aspects of transparency and accountability. Um, open safely, you can actually see all the jobs that are being running on the Open Safely server that you can just log on to the job server within a, without needing a login and see what's being run right now, if there is a job being run right now. You can see all the study code that's been run there because that gets published and all the, all the research outputs are public as well. So there is this idea of all these things should be out there in the open. There are advantages. We've already seen that mentioned in the panel talk as well earlier that the sharing of code is a really useful and powerful idea. Not having people siloed solving the same problems, but actually reusing code that others have already developed is, is a much more efficient use of your time. So documentation is really important generally for software projects. Any kind of moderately complicated software project, documentation is a useful feature to have. This is Open Safely's documentation, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, links to everything are on, on the slide deck, so if you need to link and see, links to things to see them, then look at the slides later and you can totally find that. Um, Open Safely comprises a number of different systems as, as a platform. So to get a job running from a researcher's laptop all the way to running on the data backends, there are several steps involved. The researcher needs to know how to write the study code using the libraries we provide to, to query the data. They need to know how to use the command line client, which is this package called Open Safely. It's a Python bit of software. Um, to, to be able to actually run that code locally in the same way that it runs on the backends. They need to know how to get their code onto GitHub and then to submit the code to the platform to be run and how to get their outputs and various other aspects. So there's a lot to cover. We do provide some support to people via various means, via Slack and via GitHub discussions. And there's an onboarding process where people get some time with a, an initial co-pilot. But obviously having people be able to learn this stuff themselves and uh, self-teach and be able to, to get support themselves is a, a valuable thing to have as well. We can also view this through the lens of who is documentation for. Documentation often has more than the obvious kind of potential audience. So the most obvious, if you're going to do the family fortune style top answer, you'll probably come up with this one, which is users. So we have lots of users. Internally at Bennett, we're supporting quite a lot of the researchers who are working, who do a lot of their work with Open Safely. There are also users at other organizations, either NHS affiliated organizations, other universities who are using Open Safely for their research, which where we also need to support. But it's not just users, the potential users. So people may just be interested in what your project is doing and if it's useful to, to solve their problem. 
So having your documentation in public is not a bad thing in terms of it makes it discoverable. People can find your documentation. It gets indexed by search engines. People can stumble across it and see what you're trying to do. It's also useful for people working on the project. So people like myself who have worked on the project, as an onboarding process, you need to familiarize, familiarize, I even say it, familiarize yourself with the project and start getting to grips with it. And having good documentation is a way to, to speed up that process. Developers and other organizations may need to understand how the system works when they're integrating their data with OpenSafely. Managers and academic supervisors may not be even the potential users, but may have em like employees or people they manage who may want to use it, and so that they need to determine whether it's a valid use of their time or not. We're an academic group, so academic reviewers and, and funders we're interested in, they may, they may be interested in seeing what we're actually doing. And other people working on other projects, and the general public, because OpenSafely is using data from the general public, and so people who are concerned about privacy and are technically minded may be interested in seeing, looking into our documentation, see exactly what we're doing. And again, having it out there for everyone to access on a public website, so you can just go to docs.opensafely.org, you don't need to log in, it's just all up there, means people can just look into this and see what we're actually doing. And you can do much more with OpenSafely as well, you can run all the, you can run all the code and things locally as well. Um, but just having the documentation out there is a useful start in itself. So yeah, the documentation is open. It's developed in this GitHub repository. Um, you can see, like I said, there are a lot of contributors. So they're like on there, I think, a list of 34 contributors. Like I said, it's a big team effort. And we'll see some more of that later on. So I'm going to talk about building open safety's documentation. And then how do we pronounce this thing even here? Someone actually asked on Twitter, they asked one of the developers way back, which seems really archaic now, like given the state of Twitter. But um, they, they asked, do you pronounce it make docs or MK docs? And the developer replied, I, I use muck docs. So I'm gonna use muck docs because it's, it's quicker than either of the other two to say, and time is short. So this is muck docs. Muck docs is a static site generator, if you're familiar with those already. If not, what they do is you write some content in some kind of markup language like Markdown, which we heard mentioned in the previous talk on VS Code. It's relatively simple to do. It's much easier to write in that kind of uh, markup than in H raw HTML. You then feed your content through the static site generator and it gives you out a load of HTML, which you can then do with what you want. You can put it up on a website and all you need then is a simple web server which can serve files. You don't need any fancy application server to actually uh, run, run that server. This is the theme we use, which is called Material for Muck Docs. It's a very popular one for, for, for actual documentation projects using Muck Docs. And then you put those two things together, and then you get the documentation, and I'm done, I can just walk out. No, I'm not going to, I'm going to carry on talking. So I'll explain a bit more why we're actually using Muck Docs. So originally, the, this, the nice thing about having your stuff in, in Git and version control repository is you can go back in time. So this actual commit is from before I started working at Bennett. This is from 2020. I started in 2021. So I didn't even know the reason exactly why they were using Mudbox originally. So initially, this repository, if you can't see it, there are a number of uh, markdown files in this repository. And that's it. It's relatively simple, which is a good enough bootstrap if you're starting from nothing, then just having markdown files is totally a valid thing to do, or some other kind of simple content that, that, you, that you find useful. That's all there is. It's a readme file which links to the, the markdown files, and that's it. And GitHub is actually very good at showing rich previews of even things like Markdown. So even having those files in the repository is, is quite a valuable thing as a get-go. And I think it was in this state for about four or five months. I think the repository started in May 2020, and then the state of it here was from around October 2020. But the problem that was being solved here after speaking with Seb Bacon, who's now the CTO at Bennett, who made this change, is that we're trying to go from stuff on the left-hand side, which is a Python bit of Python source code, and you can see the documentation string, which has all been lovely written out by one of the developers, to something on the right. So we can include, rather than having people having to delve into the source code to see this stuff, or mandate that they have autocomplete functionality already configured in their de development environments, they could actually have a reference where people who are not even, don't even have the software installed can go and refer to it and see what we can do. And also, but there's just a nice, nice, bit of reference for people there, so they can always, always just go back and look at it there, which is sometimes a bit more friendly. It's also formatted in a very nice way as well. So that's the problem that was being solved. And actually, the change that was required, as you can see in this pull request, which is linked in this commit here, is very simple. All that happens, if you can't really see, is that the, the documentation files that were already there, the markdown files, 
get moved into their own directory. We add some other files around um, structuring a Python project. So now this becomes a Python project rather than just simply uh, a collection of markdown files. So we add, a require, we add some requirements and we add a Python version file. And then the only other thing we need to add to get this to work with Merc Docs is this YAML file, which is very simple, just key value um, configuration, where you specify the site name, you specify the, the hierarchy of the pages um, that you want to display in the index, and you specify the plugins you want to use. One of them is this Merc Doc strings plugin, which is the thing which does that magic conversion. And that's pretty much it. And from there, you can then use this special kind of syntax, which is at the bottom of that screenshot, which we can highlight here. And that's it. Then what you get is something like this. Very, very simply indeed. So that's like a really strong selling point of, of using tools like this over just raw markdown. So that was back then. Why are we still using Merc Docs now? It's 2022. It's getting into 2023. We're still stuck with the same system. It's worked pretty well with us. Why does it work well? So we can go back to this, this screenshot of the, of the Merc Docs page, their, their home page, which details the features. So one of them is it's relatively simple to get going with. It's just a static site generator that takes markdown and simple configuration files we've seen. It also comes with a built-in development server, which helps you to, you can write content on your machine. When you save the content, it will automatically reload in your browser, so you can have the two side by side and see your changes apply um, pretty much in near instantly. There are other tools out there. So Python, the other big documentation tool in Python is called Stinks. Stinks is a bit more heavyweight. Stinks, by default, uses a markup language called Restructured Text, which is, I can't even remember the syntax of that if I'm ever using it, but it's more powerful, but then is a bit more difficult to get going with initially. So there are definitely trade-offs in, in the tools you choose. There's not necessarily a right tool or a wrong tool, it's just there are different tools with different trade-offs. And we can see again, so this is how you would set up a project, uh, a MacDocs project, really simply. So we saw again in the previous talk on VS Code, we saw talk about virtual ends. So all I, I would do is create a new virtual env for my uh, documentation, install the package, MacDocs material, which also installs MacDocs as well as a dependency. And then you can run the command, you can reuse the MacDocs command to create a new project, a skeleton project. And you can see we have this, uh, we just have a simple YAML file and uh, one placeholder stock page, which we can then fill in with our actual content. And we could serve it, but then actually one other thing we need to do is change the theme as well. And we can change the site name to reflect what we're actually doing today. And that's it. That's all you need to do to actually get your project up and running. And from there, you can just add more files in um, quite simply, as simple as that. So if you need to add more markdown files, you can do, and you can just link them into the YAML file. And that's all you need to do to continue to expand your site. So it's quite easy to use. So another powerful thing is there is lots of customization available. People have spent a lot of time making themes. MacDocs has been around for a while, so a lot of these things are quite mature. And it's easy to customize. And one way we can see this is through the theme we're using, which is called MacDocs Material. On the left-hand side, I'm not going to go through all these things in detail. This is the menu you get if you look, refer to their documentation of all the different features you can get. And on the left-hand side, they've done a lot to ex expand the HTML and uh, JavaScript over the stock, what you would get with some of the bog standard themes, to give you things like a cookie banner if you sh should wish to add one and requ or require one for, to be compliant with different legislation. You can customize the colors and the fonts and all these kind of things without needing to be a web developer. I'm not particularly a great front-end web developer, so these, these kind of things make it very easy to just customize them. On the right-hand side, we can see a lot of features which are around your actual the way you write your documentation, so the way you structure your pages, the way you structure your actual content. These features, things like fancy buttons and admonition boxes and diagrams, etc., are often provided by extensions. So markdown strength and weakness is that it's really simple. So by, by default, markdown is very limited in what you can do, but it also makes it very easy to learn and to, to make documents very quickly. How people typically get around this in static site generators is by using extended forms of markdown. And when they do this, what, you end up using diff, slightly different syntax, which tailors your, your content more to that specific bit of software a bit more, which can be a bit of a downside if you ever want to migrate, but it's, it's probably fine if you're sticking with the same thing. This is an example of some extended markdown, which is included in our Getting Started Guide. So at the top, we have this admonition box, which is a note, which has some, it's like a box out to give some extra context to the text. And we also have this, below that, we have a tab section where you can switch between the two sections and click on them. 
And all we need to do to actually include that is just, I don't know what's happening with the formatting here in the, how the slides have been translated, but um, it's relatively simple. You can just add the like, three exclamation marks or three equal signs, and then what you get is, is that, that kind of appearance of uh, this, this kind of nice layout without having to do much work at all. Another reason for using Mocdocs is it's in Python, and that's not just me name dropping to try and engender like great good feeling and popularity for my talk. It's a, it's actually a, a thing that uh, a tool that everyone in the Bennett team is the technical team is really familiar with because every, the projects we all make are, are with Python. Uh, that's been a decision as a whole as a, in our team, and because we're familiar with Python as collectively, it means that we're familiar with the tooling already. We already have Python installed. We're also familiar with installing packages, so I showed you I was able to install pip install, and I know how to do that. I don't have to go and look it up. It, we're also familiar with errors because we're software developers, so of course we're familiar with errors. Um, yeah, just being familiar with those things is a less of a barrier and less intimidating than coming across maybe some other language where something suddenly goes wrong and you don't know how to fix it, and you spend lots of time panicking about how to even understand the error. With Python, because we know Python already, then that's not so much a problem. And the same goes, if you're more familiar with R, then maybe that's a, a reason to choose more of an R tool. It also means we're familiar with the language used to write MOOC docs as well. So if you need to, again, if you need to delve into the actual source code because you want to understand the behavior of the software, that, that means you have the confidence to be able to do that, which you might not if it's a different language, or maybe only one person in the team knows how to do that if it's, in, if it's written in Go or if it's written in, in Ruby or whatever language. It also means we can extend Docs as well. So on the left is a, a small snippet. It's not the complete source from some templating plugin that some of my colleagues wrote. And what we were trying to achieve was pulling information into the documentation. This is a new page I'm kind of working on. They're pulling information from one repository into another. So the thing on the right is detailing a new thing we're working on, which is a, an electronic health record query language. And it's including, included in a new package called Data Builder. So we're pulling information out of the Data Builder repository from the tests. So the, the, the content on the right primarily comes from specification tests, which detail how the, the language behaves. And we can have very simple code on the left-hand side, which then just pulls out that information into the documentation, which is really, really useful. I would say there are some, there are advantages to having all the documentation in one place for users. It can be a bit more complicated from the point of view of us managing it as a platform, because we are pulling information from disparate bit packages and sources that can be a little bit gnarly to get in. And also, I think there are definitely questions on how we manage versions of subcomponents, which may be the case with this new data builder package um, in future, which we have to think about. But for now, it's kind of worked pretty well. So having said all that, in the last, hopefully, few minutes, I'll just cover um, the, the idea of documentation as code. This is a new, new term to me, but not necessarily a new concept. I was reading a lot more about documentation and watching talks. I did a documentation course, and from that, I, I did a bit more reading. And from that, I, I saw this term come up. And I was aware of infrastructure as code, but not documentation as code. And as it turns out, what we've been talking about in the last few slides pretty much encompasses a lot of the, the ideas people are referring to when they talk about documentation as code. So documentation as code is the idea that you should be writing documentation with the same tools as code. And on this slide, they also give you a bit more detail of specifically what they mean. So they mean using an issue tracker, they mean using version control, they mean using text markup, they mean using code reviews and automated testing. That is to say that you're writing documentation with the same tools as code, and not just that you happen to be using the same tool to write both, and you don't end up using a word processor, and I'm sure Adam would be horrified of this, to use Microsoft Word or something to write all your code and your documentation, and that is maybe not the actual intent here. You want to use the same tools for documentation as for your code. So we'll look at each aspect of that and how, how that impacts on what we, what we do. So we already said we're using a Git repository, which is really useful. It gives us advantages. We currently, for some reason, have 19 branches on our repository. Some of those are probably old, but then some of them correspond to open pull requests and independent things people are working on. It means people can work on things in parallel and independently. We can pull all those things in together. It also means, like I said, we have lots of contributors who all work on this project. Um, primarily, that's me, but then lots of other people contribute as well. We have an issue tracker, so everyone, all of this is open. You can just, it's a public repository. Anyone can see the things we're intending to work on, and we're tracking all the work we're doing in those issues, which is nice because it's a centralized place. You don't have to keep moving around to see where things are. We're also using pull requests to get code, uh, the changes to the documentation into the main branch. 
we also, once the, the changes are into the main branch, they're automatically deployed, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute or two. Here is a conversation between myself and my colleague Caroline. Um, it's nice that all this stuff is just in the open and you can see it happening. So if you want to see why something happens, in the same way I went back to show why we use smoke docs, you can see the reasons for that decision. You can also see what we're intending to work on. So that's very useful. I'd also mention this commit suggest. I don't have time to go through it, but this, this magic button here on the get, uh, pull request review feature, which is the commit suggestion button. So you can select lines of a diff in the pull request. You can then press this button, and then you can give a suggestion. You can change what someone's written, give them a suggestion which they can then include into their pull request, which is really, really good for text edits and small changes like that, rather than having to say, oh, you spelt a word wrong. Can you change this word, please? And then the person has to go and then change it themselves. Uh, it saves a lot of time. So yeah, who, I don't know if anyone actually knew this, but uh, GitHub actually has VS Code editor just built in. So if you change .com to .dev uh, in the URL of a repository, you can just go to, and you're logged in, you will get the Visual Studio Code editor in the browser, and you can have a more complex editing experience than just the bog standard GitHub uh, user interface, which is really, really useful. GitHub also have a feature called Code Spaces where you can run uh, code on a remote server in the same way and use this editor, and they I think we've made that free for some limited usage now for everyone, so you get like so many hours per month, which is a way of running stuff without having to even install it on your computer, which is really cool. So you could get people and non-developers and get them configured in a way which they can run all this stuff um, without needing a setup themselves. For publication, so we talked about MuckDocs as a static site generator. We just have HTML. We can host it anywhere. We use GitHub Actions to publish this stuff automatically. So on pushes to the main branch, this stuff gets deployed very, very quickly. We, there's no delay between those processes. There's no extra step. It's all automatic. This is a, a little bit of the workflow that's used to do that. Um, it's the, the main core part of it. It's very simple. We just pip install the dependencies. We run MuckDocs build to build the site, and then we push it with this special action which push, pushes it to a service called Cloudflare Pages. GitHub also have a service called GitHub Pages, which you could equally use as well. Cloudflare Pages does have this advantage that you get these pull request previews, which are quite, again, quite useful if you're working with other people, or people are not necessarily proper developers, they're just users, and not really interested in the technical side. They can then see a preview of what they've changed without needing to run anything at all. And we also get these automated checks at the bottom, so we know the site is still working and it hasn't been broken by anyone changing anything. They haven't accidentally deleted the configuration or changed something in a way which, which breaks it, which is really good reassurance to have when you're merging stuff in, and it's the kind of ideas you use not in, when developing code as well. So maintenance, again, we have more of these checks. So there's this extra check here which says check code snippets. So one thing I'm working on again for Data Builder is to have these uh, code snippets um, which are samples of this electronic health record query language. We want to ensure that these continue to work and they don't break for any reason, either because the library changes or because someone accidentally edits them and changes them. So these get run every time someone pushes commits to GitHub. It runs the snippet, it checks the uh, output against the existing output which it knows about, and if there's a difference then the check will fail, which is fairly rudimentary but is sufficient to pick up uh, simple errors like that. Another thing I've added recently is a link checker. So this is like a third party thing. It's really cool, it runs super quick. This is an example of a check that we have. It takes like 30 seconds to check 600 links on the OpenSafely documentation. And here, the bottom two errors are because I've, I am silly and forgot to rename links in the actual documentation, even though I changed the file names. The top one was actually an NHS link uh, writing some COVID-19 information, which is actually changed. And um, with that, you get, um, what you get is then you get the opportunity to discuss with people who are writing that content if that's still relevant or not, because you know the link has changed, maybe the context, surrounding context has changed, especially in the medical kind of context, things can change, in the technical context things could certainly change. There are lots of other automation tools which we've talked about, including which we haven't got around to, but, but you can do things like spell checking, style checking, consistency of markdown, capturing screenshots, all these kind of things which you could include in your workflows. And just to say, contribution, all this stuff is really cool for developers. You might want to think about what actual non-developers, the experience of them. They can make small edits in GitHub's user interface. You could train them to maybe use GitHub's uh, Visual Studio Code Editor in the browser or GitHub Code Spaces. Some of the automated checks we've talked about really help. And the markdown, as we've seen, is, is relatively simple, but you still might need to give people some support and training in how they actually work through this workflow when they're maybe used to working in content management systems. 
So just wrapping up and summarizing, that's just about everything now. I'll just summarize what we talked about. So I think there are definite benefits to publish your, publishing non-sensitive and non-classified documentation openly. It promotes your work, it proposes collaboration with others, and provides transparency for what you're doing. I have some prompts here, if you want to refer to the slides, of things you might want to think about when you're choosing your tools. My goal is not to say you should use MacDocs, it's that you should pick, you can pick from these documentation as code tools as you like and find something that suits you. If you're more from the R community and you just find yourself in here because you're interested, then maybe some of the R based tooling is something that you'd be more interested in, the Python tooling, and that's totally fine. Uh, finally, yeah, documentation as code is a really powerful idea. That should be something that people should be thinking about more. Um, we talked about a lot of these aspects, using text markup, using version control, using issue tracking and pull requests, de checking in deployment. You can host a site, it costs you basically nothing to do so, and you can pick and choose the tools you want to use. And some things I've used as inspiration, there's a book called Docs Like Code, which I've skimmed very quickly and seems really good in, in the overall core. Uh, explaining the core concepts is a bit dated because it's like five years old and a lot of things are kind of on the technical side have slightly changed, but as an overview to get a feel for what's involved, that's very good. There are several talks by the Write the Docs conference, uh, loads of talks there which are really useful. I wrote a post on using the Lightyear link checker based on what I've done with OpenSafely. And look at what software companies are doing as well because they've got lots of money and, and time to spend on this stuff. And using what they do as inspiration is, is a really good idea as well. That's it, thank you very much.